Welcome to Deep Look, Ulti World's weekly radio show about the current state of Ultimate. I'm the host and the editor of Ulti World, Charlie Eisenhood. And joining me is Ulti World senior editor, Keith Rayner. Keith, did you get your $1,400 stimulus check yet? Uh, I don't think ours has cleared yet. I did okay. get something else, though, from uh, from DC, so to speak. Okay. Got my first vaccine shot yesterday. Congratulations. Maybe maybe I should credit the state of Connecticut with that. I don't know. But uh, were, were you on a list or did you like get a extra one? How did it how did it play out for you? I, I got an extra one. Um, you know, my wife works at a school, so there are opportunities to be vaccinated for the staff there. Uh, and one of the things that they try and do right now is make sure that no vaccine shots are wasted. You know, they have this the nurse was telling us about it. Like, you know, she when she opens up the shots, she has six hours to get them in arms and stuff. And so like, sometimes they're literally like calling around trying to find people to come in and take this shot before it expires or whatever. Right. So uh, she was, she was joking. She was like, last time I think I, I got it in someone's arm with like two minutes to spare. So uh, you know, they, they, they want people to come in and make sure that no doses go wasted. If somebody no shows or something like that. Uh, so we took a chance and went up knowing that there was a chance there wouldn't be any and there was a chance I would find some and they didn't have one at the first site. So they called around to see if any other sites had any. And, and so we ended up finding one and uh, That's uh, I got my first dose. That's great. And we great. asked multiple. I felt so guilty. I was like, are we cutting somebody in line who like really needs this? Like, it may, can you please make sure we're not like taking somebody's dose or whatever? No, 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 no. Please take this. Well, because the thing is with the time limit. If they try to wait to find the perfect person who deserves it the most, in theory, they're not going to find that person. Right. I mean, you think back to the early days of the vaccinations, you know, early days, like two months ago, <laughs> they were wasting tons of doses because they weren't they weren't being sort of open enough. I got a shout out Connecticut, by the way, Keith. They're opening up to pretty much everybody in just a couple of weeks. Mm hmm. It's true. So I'm, I'm, I've got a head start, but not that much. I mean, they, I'm like we, Googling. We're can I close. cross? Can I cross the border <laughs> to get my vaccine? It seems like that's even if you can, it's very ethically uh, compromised, which is fair. I will wait <laughs> yeah. my turn in New York. Um, I'm actually flying for work for the first time since last March, since Stanford invite of 2020. I'm going to Milwaukee to broadcast a disc golf tournament. And so uh, that's going to be crazy. I ordered some uh, like safety goggles. I got my N95 because I'm not vaccinated yet. So I got to, you know, sit on the airplane with the whole get up on safety and, goggles. Huh? It's like it sounds like a high school lab yeah, experiment. I know it sounds crazy, but the, the research has shown that like having eye protection does um, protect you further from COVID. And, you know, I got to be inside with other people like I got a COVID test this week. So it's like a whole thing. But uh, just trying to. You know, it's like 10 bucks to get some goggles, so I might as well wear them. It sucks, but oh, well, you know, well, you know, we, we actually got a couple. So we had, we had a couple of tweets come our way um, from uh, at the youth chair on Twitter about kind of like the state of, of COVID and with relation to youth sports in Minnesota, which is supposed to play host to a YCC in the U.S. Open potentially uh, as per USAU's recent announcement. What, what were your thoughts on, on you know, the articles that were shared? The, there's some tweets that also link to articles about potential COVID variants that have been spreading through youth sports in Minnesota. Do you feel like that changed how you're thinking at all about the potential to have major events in Minneapolis? No. Uh, I, I think the – it's not super clear. And I responded to Sarah a, a bit on Twitter. Um, but, but I think the, the fact that you're seeing spread in youth sports settings has nothing to do with the sports and everything to do with the logistical things around the sports that we've been talking about on the show for the last six months, the, the travel, the locker rooms, the meals, you know, I, I, and these are mostly indoor sports as well that are sort of in this group, this outbreak that's happened. Um, you know, sure, it's in Minnesota. I, I think ultimately what this shows me is that if YCCs are going to happen, number one, you need to think about not letting people under the age of 16 
go because they can't be vaccinated in time for the tournament, uh, that at least needs to be considered. And number two, you have to think about how are we handling the, the, the logistics of the tournament? How are we ensuring that people are not packing into hotel rooms? How are we ensuring that people aren't you know, packing into restaurants? And, and the thing is, so much could be different by August that it may not even be, you know, it, it, the, the conversation might be completely different because in theory, it will be very much available to anybody over the age of 16 that wants to get vaccinated to have done so by that time. So probably restaurants are going to be open and a lot of people are going to feel very comfortable going out in public again at that point. So, you know, what that means for YCC is still a little unclear to me, but this information about the outbreak in Minnesota youth sports just shows me that you have to be diligent about, you know, not having people congregating indoors where you have the risk of COVID transmission. Uh, absolutely. And and uh, I do think, though, that there is something to be said for, you know, monitoring the environments where we plan to compete and how those localities are handling the virus. I, you know, anytime I see the word variant, it kind of like it gets me up in, in an alert mode because it's it's scary to think about, you know, potentially coming across variants that are not responding well to the vaccine. So uh, that that kind of stuff, you know, always makes me a little wary. But, uh, you know, once you dig in a little bit, you can kind of find ways to see how there are risk mitigating actions that we are already doing and more that we could be doing. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about another hypothetical event. The Fall College National Championships. Okay, so USA Ultimate hasn't really released new information about this in a few weeks, but we are expecting an update at some point soon about what the plan is for this college series in full series conferences, regionals, nationals, that's going to happen in the fall and or winter of, of this year. So, I mean, Keith, I guess, first and foremost, do you think this is a realistic thing to happen? Uh, do you, you know, we talked about this with Tom Manowitz from USA Ultimate now many months ago when we were talking about a similar event happening at the end of 2020. Obviously, that didn't happen. But now we have this one at the end of 2021 with vaccine progress looking very promising, a lot more optimism these days. So do you think we could have this tournament happen? You know, if, if vaccines are, are being distributed at the rate that they are now, and you know we're starting to see some places like, like Connecticut that are getting ready to expand you know, vaccine eligibility, uh, to the college population. So, you know, as, as we start to see that kind of spread, I think that may give us some ability to do these types of larger events, even if they involve travel. There's a lot of things to figure out between here and there. And I maybe have some skepticism about being able to have a big enough population to fill in events like sectionals uh, or conference championships or whatnot. You know, if, if they have half of the teams, like, is it really worth going to to play get four games but everybody's going to want to be able to play so maybe that point will be moot when we actually arrive at that that point you know people will want to play so much that they're willing to travel to play a few games even if they play the same teams a few times in a row uh so you know i think that that having a full series is it feels ambitious but achievable uh and then having nationals you know do i think it will be a complete nationals do i think it'll feel like what a traditional spring nationals would? Of course not. Like, would I be, I would not count on the full field of your traditional nationals teams being there either. And so, you know, in that, in that sense, I think that, you know, it'll be challenging, but I do think there'll be enough interest that teams will want to participate. Uh, who knows what will happen with rosters given eligibility and who will be able to play, uh, who will be eligible to play all those kinds of things. Uh, it, I think it'll be messy, but I think it'll, uh, that's, so for me, it's, it's like not something I feel like I can treat the same way I would or traditional nationals from a like significance within the ultimate landscape standpoint, but more is like, sure. Hey, we're going to celebrate the chance to return to play and celebrate what we love about college ultimate and give these people who maybe didn't get a chance to end their seasons on the right note or their college careers, a chance to do so again. Uh, it, it'll be very interesting, but I still feel like there's, so many details that we don't know that it's tough to like prognosticate about the event outside of like, do we think it might happen? Yeah. I mean, of course I, I think here's what's, here's what's going to be amazing about this event. If it happens, 
USA Ultimate is signaling right now that they're going to allow incoming freshmen to play and they're going to allow those who graduated in 2020 and 2021 to play, assuming that their college lets them even if they're no longer enrolled. Now, that's going to create probably some weird competitive imbalances where you have certain schools that are cool with that and others that are saying, no, you can't have you know people who've graduated play but i think you know so you're, you're in a hypothetical situation you got 25 year olds coming out to play with the college team playing with brand new rookies at this you know nationals event that is happening after the teams have probably only had a couple of months to get ready i mean in theory i'm writing about this in the mailbag this week so i'll have kind of like a more substantial detail of this but i think most teams are probably only going to have like maybe six weeks to practice before sectionals or conferences it's now called um so i it's going to be kind of crazy like are there going to be some warm-up tournaments and we, we obviously don't know right now what the scene is going to look like in uh you know even even three months from now but uh i'm i'm, I'm hoping this event happens because it's going to be like uh, such an exciting way to kick off the fall and, and, you know, uh, maybe this is the, the small college, so to speak, like it, small college program coaching me, but like, you know, it feels a lot like it'll be the haves and the haves not the have nots. You know, if you have a, a major institutional program with, uh, a long line of talented alumni and great recruiting and stuff, you're just gonna have a massive advantage, but you know what, that would have been true in a normal college season anyway. So, uh, maybe there's no point in crying over the spilt milk on that. Uh, you know, maybe we'll see some, some assorted transfers or whatnot, you know, maybe Charlie and I will suit up for somebody. I don't know, but, uh, let's, you know, it's, let's go. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll jump in, but cleats. I'm ready to go. <laughs> it reminds me somebody, somebody tweeted way back when we first wrote about the eligibility extension. Someone was like, I'm really here for 25 year old skying, like, uh, yeah. fresh face, 18 year old rookies. And I said, Oh, maybe you should try watching a BYU game. So, uh, you know, that's been, it's, it's happened right here Wait, and there. You've beaten the, the joke to death. You it's a good joke. <laughs> I'm ready. I, I need them to codify celebrity <laughs> point into the rules. <laughs> Save that for so our that rule changes. Show. Walk sideline and just hop on for a point. Um, <laughs> I will only throw scubers. So, uh, you know, we, we wait to see what, what happens and what USA Ultimate announces about this. But I understand that they're working really hard to try to make it happen. And uh, to me, a lot of it comes down to what rules do the universities have in place. Right now, you're still seeing travel restricted. If that's still true next semester, I mean, that kind of kills any chance of this event happening. Yeah. But in theory, I expect to see things snap back to sort of regular, normal travel operations and university operations very suddenly. I think it's going to be, you know, one or two schools come out and announce it. And then boom, you see everybody like rolling back the restrictions. That's exactly how we saw it play out when the restrictions started going into place back in March, where it was a couple schools. And then, you know, the Ivy League pulled out of March Madness and then all of March Madness was canceled and then everybody shut everything down. So it could, yeah, it could be a bigger, look similar. It could be a bigger domino like that, like a like a big state school system making a change. Right. Uh, you know, like what we saw with California when we went into restrictions. But those kinds of things could suddenly line up a bunch of schools all at once, and that'll kind of like push the rest of the country to kind of catch up. Well, we're going to talk some more college ultimate right now with a couple of players from UNC Pleiades, Alex Barnett and Sydney Rader both captains for the UNC women's team that was probably the favorite to win the national championships had they taken place a year ago and will certainly be one of the best teams in the country this coming fall season and <laughs> in 2022 as well. So looking forward to talking with them. Stick around. You're listening to Deep Look. this. You just joined a wacky group of friends masquerading as an ultimate team, and you're trying to balance Frisbee and the rest of your life when BAM! A worldwide pandemic hits, and you're not sure what your life purpose is anymore. Well, we're not here to help with that, but we will struggle along with you. 
We're the hosts of Old Two World's newest podcast, Laying It Out. We'll introduce you to the weird, wonderful world of Ultimate, reminisce about our days playing in college, and offer you advice about what we learned along the way. We are by no means role models, but we're asking the same questions you are about how to carve out your own place in this community and how to survive and thrive on your way there. We'll be releasing new episodes every other week, so look out for us. For now, I'm Chelsea Pockets. And I'm Scotty Dempsey. Catch you on the flip. Joining us now on Deep Look are Alex Barnett, a senior captain at UNC, and Sydney Raider, a junior captain at UNC. Welcome to both of you. Thanks for having us. Well, thank you for yes, thank you for joining us. Um, it is it has been a very weird time for College Ultimate. Obviously, we haven't really had formal college play since last March. It's been over a year at this point. Uh, so I guess first and foremost, how has that experience been for for you and for for this UNC Pleiades team um, that, of course, was you know one of the favorites to win the national championships if they'd happened last year? Uh, Alex, uh, I'll I'll throw that to you. You know, just what's this last year been like uh, trying to to run a, a college ultimate team? Well, it was a real bummer at first. I feel like. Uh... Up until May, I think we we're all like hoping that, you know, the pandemic would resolve itself and we'd be able to like play some sort of like former spring nationals. Like we'd already trained so hard and like had like this great team bonding thing going on. So we're really excited to go to nationals with that group of people. Um, but I think once that became clear that that wasn't going to happen, um, it we just sort of buckled down and tried to make do with what we had. Um, I think that we've been really lucky to have um, some opportunities to like still play and like you know be connected as a team that i don't think a whole lot of uh programs have had so that's been good at least and what what have you been doing during that time i mean you mentioned that you've had some opportunities to play Uh, was the team able to train when when you weren't able to see each other were you connecting virtually sydney what has that been like And, and what has the team actually done to fill in that kind of gap in time between competition yeah, between um, March and May, so like last year's season, we were holding virtual like Zoom sessions every now and then. Um, we tried to do some like workout sessions and things like that virtually, but it's pretty hard um, to like keep that up when there's no, uh, you know, there's no destination for that yet. Especially in March, April, May, it really didn't feel like we had no idea um, when the next time we were going to be playing was. And um, when we came back to school in August, we were like looking, we're working with sports clubs um, at UNC and like trying to figure out if there was a way that we could be back in person. Um, and I think it was around September, we were able to like social distance masked hold practices. Um, so we started doing open practices, basically like anyone who wanted to come play could come hang out because tryouts weren't really feasible at that time. Um, and we just recently held tryouts in February and like um, made the team. So that's, it's been difficult, but like, thanks to our coaches, um, like who are kind of creative geniuses, we've been able to sort of finagle um, a pretty good system. I think that is both safe and like beneficial to the team. Yeah, obviously UNC is a program with a, with a lot of weight at this point. So Recruiting perhaps is not the same challenge for a team like Pleiades as it might be for other college teams, which are really just pulling people who've never never played before. Uh, but but what was the tryout process like? I mean, were you able to to get the kind of turnout that you typically do, or was it more kind of an invite only type situation? Uh, it's actually funny that you mentioned uh, that because uh, this year we actually took a lot of people who have never played before. Uh, we took. F- four or five who had never touched a disc before in their lives, but um, they seem very like athletic and very interested and enthusiastic. So we're very happy to have them on the team. Um, We did also have a couple interesting situations of people coming from um, like other programs, like uh, Karen uh, Earhart from uh, Carleton is now doing like a a chemistry program at UNC. So we're lucky to have her like come out to some practices and stuff. Um, 
So we've had a super mixed bag of talent uh, at like this year's tryouts, which was really cool to see. Um, and in terms of what we were actually doing is we did a lot of throwing um, and a lot of like running, just seeing like how quick people pick up um, skills and how athletic they are. Uh, we weren't able to do much like in terms of field sense, unfortunately, like no scrimmaging or anything. Uh, so it's going to be interesting to see how those skills develop in our like uh, new tryouts. You mentioned you mentioned Karen Earhart being added to the team. Uh, you know Grace Connerly, another player who uh, has already competed at the college level and had a lot of success uh, in a, in a brief career so far. But uh, another player who was listed on the team's twenty twenty one roster. Uh, what's it like bringing in these these experienced players who can bring so much to the team right away? How's that helped the team, Sydney? Yeah, I mean it's it's been great to have them. Obviously, we appreciate. Um, anyone who can come in and, you know, immediately fit into our systems. Um, Karen and Grace are both incredibly talented players. Um, and it's weird because we can't really like scrimmage yet. So they're still like getting used to the team, but um, yeah, it's, it's been really great. We're really lucky to have them. So, so what, what are the rules in place right now from club sports department? You're, you're, you're having indoor practices but so is are there social distancing guidelines in place you can't be within six feet we're we're holding outdoor practices right now um okay. there are social distance social distancing policies we're always supposed to have a mask um unc has a really great testing program going on right now so all sports club athletes are supposed to get tested twice a week um and oh. then we upload those test results to the whole team so everyone knows um what's going on and um yeah, the most recent guidelines are um, that you can scrimmage for either a short amount of time or with lower numbers, so like 2v2 or 3v3. Um, so we started moving into that. Um, the other good thing that started happening is that we're all getting vaccinated recently. Um, the majority of our team has its first dose of the vaccine, so that's also making us feel a lot safer. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Is North Carolina do specifically getting like college students vaccinated now or how, how did that come to pass because most most states you know if you're your age you're just not eligible yet uh, a lot of our teammates have been uh actually uh involved in a lot of outside things outside of ladies that makes them eligible so uh we have a couple people who are working with like kids in like a child care setting um some people who are working in like a health care setting but the most um like prominent way that people are getting vaccines uh through like our team is by volunteering at the testing center. Uh, so people who spend their time um, at the testing center, like helping like distribute vaccines and tests, uh, often become eligible. So it's a cool way to like give back and right, then also right. end up getting the vaccine, which is a cool system. Take take notes, other college programs. I mean, there yeah. there's a there's a ticket right there to to help your team and your community. So it's a it's a twofer. Uh, I'm curious about the 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 time in prepping for you mentioned Cindy that there's there wasn't a destination before and now there kind of is you know we have this speculative fall championship what what is it like preparing for a season that's unlike any other that we've gone into I mean for Pleiades our goal is always to win everything um you know when we start the season we're like okay here are our goals here are our process goals here are our outcome goals and the majority of them were like okay we're gonna win all the tournaments and then we're gonna win sectionals we're gonna re win regionals we're gonna win nationals like we have really high expectations of ourselves and of the whole team um and like whatever this weird fall nationals thing is, our goal is to individually improve as much as we can during this time so that when we come back in August and September and hopefully everything is um, like more people are vaccinated and everything is safer and more open back up that um, we'll be able to be like the best team that we can be. Alex, do you feel like you got robbed of a title in 2020? <laughs> I mean, there's no way to, you know, to, to know how it's actually going to shake out. But I think we're definitely robbed of an opportunity um, to honestly, yeah, just <laughs> uh, honest, we had a really crazy roster and a lot of talent. And it was it was a huge bummer to see that, like not even have a chance to work with that. Do you think I, I know this is an impossible question to answer because you have not even been able to scrimmage, 
But do you think that this roster that you have for 2021 and then as much as possible projecting into next year, I don't know if you know what kind of rookies you're going to get. Uh, do you think that team could be better than the 2020 team that we last saw on the field? I mean, if all of the people from the 2020 team are allowed to come back through UNC sports clubs and we're just adding new talent, then <laughs> I can see that being huge for us. But um, otherwise, it's really hard to tell. We're so early in the process right now. And all of our rookies look, I mean, are already like growing so much that I'm, I'm very impressed so far. But what do, you, what do you think, Sydney? Yeah, it's hard to know. Um, you know, like at the beginning of last season, we in 2019 we weren't sure that the team was going to be as good as the year before um and then all of the rookies stepped up in a really big way in the spring season so i think it it really just depends on the growth of the team over the course of the season it's hard to call you know right now what it's going to look like i don't i don't even know even how this is going to work like if we have a fall nationals are teams going to have rookies that they added like 2 months prior like yes. or will they not like, would you bring those people? Are those people going to play at nationals? Like, you know, feasibly six weeks after they first picked up a disc. Like, I don't know what the heck's going to happen. So I, I, I'm as much in in the dark as as y'all are. My, my team currently, I'm, I coach at UConn and uh, we still aren't able to practice. So uh, who, who even knows uh, what it's going to be like come fall for, for everybody and what the environment's going to be like. But I, from the sense of things that I get is that the – triangle area is pretty connected. So I'm curious if you have a sense of what other schools in North Carolina, like what their experience has been like, are there other schools that you know are able to practice? Is there a potential that you could actually compete against other people locally? Uh, Alex, is, is that something that you know anything about? I don't know much about the other college teams. I know that um, a lot of high school teams are starting to get back into practicing Um Private schools like like DA, I think, are allowed to like sort of like practice and scrimmage how they see fit. And then the public schools are going back um, fairly soon. Uh, I don't know a whole lot about the college teams. Um, Sydney, do you know anything about like State or Duke? Yeah, I I don't I'm not sure about NC State or Duke um, and like where they are at. But that would be our goal. Really, ultimately, is that by April, late April or May. Um, pretty much the end of the school year, we would maybe be able to scrimmage with someone if that was like a safe option. Um, but yeah, nobody has really reached out to us so far um, about where their team is at in terms of like 2021 rosters and all that. How are you feeling about the way that that UNC as a university has handled the COVID pandemic? Um and, you know, in a holistic sense, not just from the ultimate side of things, but also from, you know, the way that they've planned for having classes and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't know how many years now, I'm 10 years out of college at this point. <laughs> so I have no idea what the college scene is like. And I know it's different everywhere. So uh, how would you grade the school on what they've done through this time? I think it was pretty bad last fall. Um, like they, they had people coming back to classes when it wasn't really necessary. Um, we had a really big outbreak in August because, um, the Greek life had a ton of cases that I think is pretty classic in any university experiences that, um, issue. But, um, I think they've been better this spring with the testing availability has made it a lot easier. Like contact tracing is such a huge part of managing the pandemic. So, I think they've certainly improved, but I would say, yeah, they they weren't doing great last fall and even last spring. I'm curious about the, you, we, you know, we talked a little bit about the eligibility and how that might open up opportunities for players to, to compete with the team and uh, in the future. How has the process been figured out? You know, are, are you talking to individual players who maybe thought that they were going to leave the team or maybe you're coming back? Like, do you have a sense of who might come back? Like, what is that the logistics of that process look like for you all, Alex? I'd say it's less like organized logistics and more just like, I don't know, please, this is a family and we all like keep in touch with each other. Anyways. <laughs> so like, you know, we're all trying to convince like, you know, all the upperclassmen to come back and stay around. Um and so far, I think we've done a pretty good job of convincing people to stick around. Uh, 
the pandemic, one of the things that's been good about it is it's kept people in the area. Um, even people who are going to leave for jobs and stuff might have more of a chance to stick around, which would be cool for eligibility stuff. Um, unfortunate for like, you know, them getting out and experiencing life, but uh, I guess they'll get there eventually, you know, after college frisbee. College frisbee right. is more important. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, I, I don't know if you're planning to take a fifth year um, or, or you're going to be graduating this year. J just in general for UNC, are people starting to think about taking the extra option for not just a fifth year, but even a sixth year because of the eligibility extension that USA Ultimate has made? I mean, yes, pers personally, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to stick around in Chapel Hill, um, at least, you know, see what I can uh, make work. Uh, I'll definitely try to stick around for the fall. Um, and we only have one other senior on the team right now, uh, Connie, and she's also planning on trying to stick around for at least the fall. Um, and I think six years, that's so far in the future. I, that's, I can't plan that far ahead, but I think a lot of people would be interested in trying to milk as much of that as possible. Um, I know that the, the men's team, uh, Dark Side, has been, they, they always try to do that. So we have a lot of resources on how to work the system and stay in school as long as possible. So. And we're th second Callahan. What, what are we thinking? <laughs> we'll probably have to pass on the torch to someone else. <laughs> <laughs> she deserves to, though. How much planning are you thinking about trying to do for this fall college, you know, series? So far, what we understand is that USA Ultimate is really trying to make it happen. Um, we're awaiting details, which we should get in the next month or two. And, uh, you know, are, is that something that's on your mind as a target for, uh, you know, kind of the reason that you're practicing right now? Absolutely. Like that is the next biggest event that we know that we'll be able to play in. And that will have been a year and a half since any competition um, in College Ultimate. So I think that that's really what everyone's thinking about right now. Um, and I don't know the scope of any other events that they would hold in the fall um, outside of the series. But that is, um, that's definitely what we're planning for and what we're working towards right now. Alex, how do you communicate that to the team? You, know, you mentioned that you have rookies who've never played Ultimate before. Uh, and then you have, you know, experienced players who are, how do you communicate and say, you know, okay, this year is different than every other year and here's what we're doing. And we're, I know we're going to practice for X amount of months and then we'll maybe not be at school together and come back and then practice again and bring on new people. Like what, what is it like explaining that process to the team and getting everyone to buy in to compete for a championship that's kind of has a murky future months down the line? Um, honestly, it's been, yeah, that part has been pretty difficult. Um, it's hard to prioritize like that when some people have never actually seen a full game of ultimate being played. Um, so it's hard to be like, oh, this is the thing that you should absolutely be working for when they haven't even seen us like really scrimmage. Um, so that part's been tricky, but I think that the returners have done a great job about being like really enthusiastic about that fall season. And if we just all believe that it's going to happen, I mean, like the downfall there is if it doesn't happen, like we'll, you know, we'll be crushed, you know, that's going to, that's going to blow. But um, I think, you know, the odds look good. And I think we like, you know, we're, 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 it gives us a reason to work really hard. So I think that the returners have all really bought into it, which gives the rookies a reason to buy into it. Right. Um, at S Sydney, what, when you look ahead to the fall, I mean, actually, let me look backwards and ask this. Well, for those of us that haven't played Ultimate in quite a while, I have not played even, I mean, I've thrown a little bit, but I haven't played Ultimate since, I don't even know, like last, probably fall 2019, because I didn't play, the Spring League didn't start up in New York uh, by the time the pandemic hit. So for those that haven't played, what was it like to get back on the field and play some semblance of Ultimate for the first time? It's pretty incredible. I mean... It's such a big part of our lives. Like, I feel like anybody who's probably listening to this podcast spends way too much of their time on Ultimate. Um, and, like, not having it. That was the longest I've ever played Ultimate. Not, not played Ultimate since I started. I started when I was 11 and hadn't taken that long of a break um, since this year. So wow. it was, like, it was a lot. It was very exciting. Um, it was messy. 
to like try and play again and be on a field with people um because you know you forget that muscle memory and what you're supposed to be doing um and everybody just wants to play um but yeah I I really hope that um things are safe soon um so that everyone gets that opportunity because it was it was really special awesome well, thank you both for uh, for joining us here. We'd love to have you back for our subscriber bonus segment. We're going to put you on the hot seat with some uh, rapid fire questions. Sound good? Sounds good. Thank you for having us. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Alex Barnett, Sydney Rader with us here on Deep Look. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Deep Look. Thanks again to Alex and Sydney for stopping by. Uh, speaking of college sports, March Madness starts today. We've got some of the play-in games. First round starts tomorrow. Um, I, I barely watch college basketball outside of this two-week period that's about to start. But uh, Keith, all right, you got a you got a pick to win it all this year? Well, I think I think the big question is is Gonzaga or no. You know, it's 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 a it's kind of a Gonzaga versus the field year in the in the men's division, uh, and you know, I, I I don't see any reason really to argue against Gonzaga aside from that there are sixty three other teams uh, that are not as good. Uh, but I guess maybe all together, <laughs> maybe they maybe they can take down Gonzaga. But uh, I I wouldn't bet on it. I think Gonzaga is a, a heavy favorite and and with good reason. Uh, you know, in the, on the women's side, which, you know, they, they don't start, uh, until the 21st, uh, that I think is a little more up in the air, but you know, I coach UConn, what am I going to do? Not not pick UConn, like layup for me, Paige Becker's all the way, maybe. Yeah. I I mean, so I, again, I don't think I've literally watched a single minute of Gonzaga basketball this year, but I did pencil them in as the winners in my bracket. I mean, what I'm hearing is that they're one of the best college teams of like a generation that they're insanely good. So I, I love the Gonzaga thing, by the way. I'm, I'm sure there's a story out there about how Gonzaga became a basketball powerhouse. You know, no one ever talks about Gonzaga for any <laughs> other reason besides yeah. college hoops. So shout out to them for, you know, being the Carlton of college basketball. We used to, there was a, we, you know, we used to do March Madness when I coached at Emory and there was a player who thought it was uh, pronounced Gonzaga. <laughs> and we made fun of this person for, uh, many years for saying Gonzaga. Every every March came around, they were like Gonzaga. It's Gonzaga season. Uh, but uh, it, you know, I, I, are you are you looking at are you looking at, at placing any bets here? Is there anything you like going into the I, into the tournament? I got a bunch of bets already down. Love it. Um, here's my best bet, I'm, but the number is not as good anymore. I got Ohio plus nine and a half, and that was nine my, and a half. That was my slam. I missed the ten because my book didn't put the number up. Uh, until the line had already moved, but I got him at nine and a half, and that's my best bet. I think it's a seven or seven and a half today, and I st- I still like it at that number. Uh, yeah, I have uh, it at seven and a half. I have that same game. I can't believe you got it at nine and a half. Nine and a half. Yeah, that's juicy. Yeah. So uh, I, I basically made all my bets as soon as lines went up, and uh, I'll I'll probably look at it again tomorrow or you know tonight. But uh, that's that's my best bet. What do you what What's yours? Uh, I mean, honestly, I'm, I haven't put this down yet, but I'm thinking about going to put just take Gonzaga to win it all. I mean, if you're they, they're what's like, the, what's the number right plus now? 210 or something like that right now? And I really feel like they're more like an even <laughs> like it's more like 50 50 or maybe like plus 120 or something like that. So like that's a lot of a lot of expected value to get. But there's to a get lot back of there. years where the best team doesn't win. That's true. That's true. But not a lot of years were like a team that's so much better than the if, if there were like other teams, I felt like were really good. That might make me feel differently. But I, I feel like the other teams are not really that good. Um, best bet. I mean, there's a couple bets that I really like. You know, I, I like Ohio. Uh, I like Colgate uh, against the spread. I have them plus nine versus Arkansas. Uh, but I think if I had to pick, I like Colorado because I don't. Colorado, there's five twelve game Colorado and Georgetown uh, on the men's side, and uh, I, I really don't buy this Georgetown team. I think they're like, they're really happy to have gotten this to have had the success in the Big East tournament that they did, uh, and they're not really that good. And Colorado is so uh, I like I like that one. 
I laid I laid twenty points with Houston. I don't know if I That's, like that, but twenty is a lot it's of a lot. points. You they're, know, they're way better. I forget I forget the team they're playing now. They're playing right. Cleveland State. Cleveland State. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just think they're that much better. But we'll see. I don't almost almost never do that. But are you taking any outright dogs to win? Taking or any outrights? Outright to win. No. Mm-mm. I, I'm I'm, I'm shopping. I'm shopping to see where there where there may be an edge. I, I have Eastern Washington over Kansas at plus four ninety. Okay, that's All right. I do I I do I believe it? Like no, but do I think that they could win and that they're more likely to win than plus four ninety indicates? Then yes. So okay. that's that's my thought. Just gotta find the value. You do. So uh I'm actually I'm gonna put a number of Keith. I'm answering one of your questions in the mailbag this week. If and I'll I'll leave it to people to go read the mailbag to get the my 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 line. If the USA at the World Games instead of playing against other countries, played against a combo world team that's comprised of the best players of the other seven countries that qualify for the World Games, who's the favorite and what's the line? So I've got it, I, I've got answers for you in the mailbag, Keith. Are you just teasing or do you want me to answer what my well, thoughts you, are? Why don't you put your why don't you put your number out there and then people can see my uh mailbag. I I would take the U.S. Uh, I'm trying to decide between minus one and a half and minus two and a half, so maybe minus two. Uh, it's just where I should line with that. Uh, but we'll we'll give the world world some love and do minus one and a half. U.S. minus one and a half. All right. Well, you'll have to see what I say. I'm very uh, curious now. I'm gonna have to read the mailbag. Yeah, there you go. You got me. <laughs> In our subscriber bonus segment, we'll be talking with Alex and Sydney. They're gonna we're gonna put them on the hot seat. Ask them. Who's the best player on UNC? What's their biggest, what, what team do they most look forward to playing against? What was their best game in 2020? A whole bunch more. So join us for that. And uh, we'll talk to you next week right here on Deep Look. <laughs>